We had some issues with the video last uh, week, but I'm recording it now, and uh, I think it should be fixed uh, starting from today. Okay, so let's jump right into the lecture, which is here. Okay, perfect. So, minimize that. So, uh, today our goal is to really understand some of the fundamentals of uh, light, particularly, and also specifically light from the sun or solar radiation. So, the basics are quite straightforward. You know, sunlight is the source of all, uh, all of Earth's energy. Uh, of course, creates, uh, pro provides heat and, and produces food in the form of photosynthesis. And the, and the whole uh, life cycle of uh, plants and animals. Fossil fuels are essentially a form of stored solar energy from millions of years ago, because you can imagine coal and oil and so on were essentially fossilized uh, dinosaurs or plants from millions of years ago. Just a sec, so, sorry. Yep. Um, okay, can you say again? Yes, hello, hello, testing, hello. testing. Something went, ha something happened with the audio. Uh, Testing, testing. Can you hear me? No. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, when I, I can hear you on my laptop. But... Okay, how about now? Can you hear? Hello, 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 hello. Testing, testing, testing. Is this any better? <laughs> okay, now. Hello, hello, hello. No. Testing, 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 testing. <laughs> You can't hear me? Uh, just just a sec. Let me try again. Sorry. Something happened to the audio. I can see your video, but I cannot hear you. You can uh, turn up can the you, volume. Can you say again? Yes. Hello, 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 hello. Testing, testing, testing. No? no? Nothing at all? Is it completely muted? Is, is it completely muted? No, no, no. I can hear you on my laptop. It just stopped projecting the audio on the classroom in, in the classroom. Uh, yeah, yeah, now it's good. Now it's good. Okay. Now it's good. No, it's, sorry, sorry. Sorry about Okay, I'm not touching the laptop anymore. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. We well we'll work out some of these kinks as we go along. Okay. So fossil fuels are of course also stored solar energy for millions of years ago. Uh, biomass is another form of solar energy because it converts uh, plants to fuel. So, so plants are of course getting energy from the sun as well. Now wind is also solar because it's a result of heated air and earth rotation. So, so again, you can relate it to that. Even hydropower is generated by the sun since evaporated water, of course the water evaporation happens because of the sun and returns to earth as rain and fills the dam. So in a sense, of course, any form of energy, whether it's renewable or not, uh, can be traced back to the sun. So something we should uh, oops, keep in mind. Now, in terms of the basic properties of the light, there are a few key things that we need to be aware of for the purposes of this class. Um, of course, uh, electromagnetic theory is a very broad field, so we are not going to cover all of that, but we need to understand some basic concepts. So first thing to understand is light can exist as a wave and as a particle. Now the wave, and we will come back to that idea later on, but the wave property of, the, of, of light is uh, determined by something called the wavelength of light, and which is essentially the... the um, now, if you think of wave uh, of light as a wave, uh, for instance, on an ocean, it is wavelength is the distance between the two peaks of the wave. Okay, and we, some of us have learned this before. Uh, the wavelength defines essentially the spectrum of the light. So the light can exist as radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, visible waves, ultraviolet waves, X-ray waves, gamma rays, and so on. Of course, when we talk about light, we typically refer to the visible light. Now here, these numbers here represent the wavelength in meters. So give you an idea, radio waves are, uh, are about um, 1,000 meters or a kilometer long in wavelength. Microwaves are about a centimeter uh, long in wavelength. Red is about a micron or so. Uh, sorry, about 10 microns or so. Visible is roughly half a micron and shorter wavelength for this way. 
The frequency is something slightly different. Frequency refers to how fast is the wave oscillating. As we know, or you can tell from the term electromagnetic wave, uh, the electromagnetic wave is an oscillation of the electric and the magnetic field. So the oscillation happens in both space and time. Now, this refers to oscillation in space. This refers to oscillation in time. So frequency measured in hertz is how many cycles per second uh, is the electric field and magnetic field oscillating. And these are inversely related by the speed of light, as we will see shortly. So here you can see that the frequency is actually increasing as you go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So the radio waves have a frequency of 10,000 10, hertz. So this is the radio waves. The microwaves have a frequency of 10 raised to 8 hertz. Uh, visible has a frequency of something like 10 to the 14, uh, 13 hertz, and so on and so forth. So you can see the frequency is increasing this way. Wavelength is decreasing um, uh, this way, left to right. Here also, if you focus in on the colors of the visible part of the spectrum, there's a very specific arrangement. And this arrangement is very important. We go from red, orange, uh, yellow, green, um, indigo, violet, uh, so blue and violet and so on. This is a very specific arrangement of colors. Yeah, we'll come back to this again. Now, how do we relate uh, the basic properties of light in terms of frequency and wavelength. So as I said before, light exists both as a wave, and defined by its wavelength and frequency. So wavelength is oscillation in space, frequency is oscillation in time. It also exists as a particle, it's the same thing. So, uh, and the particles, of course, determine, uh, 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 is, is defined by its momentum, like a car has momentum as it travels, and its energy, okay? So light from our quantum mechanical understanding of nature exists as both a wave and a particle, which means that there is a relationship between this wavelength and frequency description of light and the momentum and energy description of light. And that is this very simple equation. The energy of a photon of light, a photon is a particle of light, is defined as H, which is Planck's constant, constant, and we'll come back to that, times the frequency of light. Okay, so the energy of a particle of light, which is a photon, is H, some constant, multiplied by frequency. Now, if we just focus on this very simple equation, we can see as frequency increases, energy increases. Okay, now we'll come back to that in a second. This energy is also equal to H C over lambda, where C is the speed of light and lambda is the wavelength. So you can see from this equation that the frequency is related to the wavelength in inverse fashion. Nu, the frequency, is equal to C over lambda. As frequency increases, lambda decreases, as you saw before, okay, in the previous slide. So just coming back to the spectrum, frequency increases, wavelength decreases. But frequency increases, energy of the photon increases. Okay, this is a, qualitatively, you should try to appreciate this. So another way to think about this is the ultraviolet photons, each photon of ultraviolet light has more energy than each photon of the microwave light. This is, by the way, why ultraviolet light can cause cancer, because that energy in the extra, excess energy in that photon can be transmitted into the, into the cell of a body and cause uh, mutations in its DNA, which cause cancer. The, there are certain characteristics of light that are relevant to our class in terms of energy. These are the spectral content of any light. So in other words, how does the energy of the light get distributed across the different wavelengths or frequencies? Okay, We'll see these things again and again. Second thing is the rate, power, density of sunlight, which we talked about briefly last week, but essentially it is, for instance, the power density of light on the surface of Earth. Uh, when we say radiant, it's a session, uh, typically refers to the fact that you integrate over all the frequencies and all the way. Number three, angle at which the sun incident sunlight strikes an observer. We'll come back to this later. The radiant energy from the sun throughout the year. In other words, what happens as you integrate is a function of time. All of these are very important when we design optical systems uh, relevant to sun, particularly. Okay. 
So looking into these equations in a little more detail, the energy of the photon again is h times the frequency or h times c divided by the wavelength. And h is the Planck's constant is given by 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Okay, so that's just a universal constant, it does not change, but the units are interesting. So let's just look at them quickly. This is units of joule seconds. Frequency is units of per second or cycles per second. So if I multiply joule seconds with cycles per second, my second cancels out and it end up with joules. So that is indeed energy, efficient, uh, the, the unit of energy. Okay. But since this number is so small, 10 raised to minus 34, we can also express energy in units of electron volts or EV. One electron volt is the energy required to raise an electron through one volt potential. Okay, so if an electron is accelerated through a one volt potential, it gains potential energy uh, and also kinetic energy, by the way, of uh, actually it gains kinetic energy because of the added potential energy given to it in any case. And that amount of energy is referred to as one electron volt. And that in joules is simply 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, which is simply the charge of an electron. Okay, some of you might recognize that. So this is a very small number here. And, and because this uh, Planck's constant is a very small number, if we use electron volts, it's a lot easier to handle. So instead of having these very, very small uh, numbers. Okay, now photon flux. Photon flux is a very important quantity as we, as we will see later on, primarily for solar cells. But photon flux is defined as the number of photons per second per unit area. So think about how much light is incident on a solar cell. And let's imagine it has a unit area, which means it's at an area of one meter by one meter. How many photons are incident on it every second? That's what photon flux will give you, okay? This determines, so if we assume that each photon gives rise to one electron whole pair in a solar cell, this number essentially determines the number of electrons generated in a solar cell. In other words, this determines how much current is produced by the solar cell. We'll see this again, but that's the key concept. Now phi, photon flux, is of course the number of photons divided by time divided by area, and it's in units of per number per second per meter squared. Okay. Now, but photon flux does not give any information on the photon energy, okay? The flux refers to the fact that it is just a number, how many particles actually went into an absorber like a solar cell. It has nothing to do with energy. It, it doesn't say anything about the energy. So power density, is what's important. It's calculated by multiplying the photon flux by the energy of a single photon. Now, here we are assuming that all the photons have the same energy or the same wavelength or the same frequency, okay? If that is the case, H, which is power density, watts per meter squared or power per unit area, oops, sorry. Ah. And it is about power per unit area is photon flux. Oops, sorry. Photon flux multiplied by the energy of one photon. Okay, so this is the number of photons per unit time per unit area multiplied by energy per photon. So this is joules. This is per second per meter squared. Joules per second is watts per meter squared. Okay? Note that this is wavelength dependent because now we have lambda here. Okay? Now I want to take, uh, I want you to answer this question. Take about 30 seconds or so and discuss with your neighbor. Okay? So it's kind of a qualitative question but conceptual question. Now, if a red, beam, let's imagine a red laser pointer has the same power density as a blue laser pointer, which laser pointer has higher photon flux? Okay, take about 30 seconds. 
and up with them, you can um, encourage them to discuss. Yeah. And this is something you should be able to answer from the concepts that we just learned in the last few slides. And of course, feel free to talk. <laughs> Can you see the class? Yes, I can, but you don't need to move the laptop in case it messes up the audio. Uh, I, I can hear you guys too, so you can shout out if you have questions or comments. Yeah, if anyone has answers, maybe raise their hand or shout out. Okay. Okay. In, in in the interest of time, tell tell me what what the answer was. I heard someone say something. Yeah. One answer is that the blue beam would have higher photon flux. Does anyone have anything else? Hey, hey, well, uh, instead of the answer, I would like to know the logic. Yeah. So your logic was that because blue has a shorter wavelength. So, so it should have a higher energy. Yes. yes. So if the uh, power, yeah, sorry, there's another. Sorry, would, wouldn't it be red? Because if, if, if the red has a, a smaller energy per wavelength and it has the same amount of, uh, has the same amount of power density, you need more red. Yes, exactly, exactly, you're correct. Okay, so so let's 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 uh, unpackage what he just said. So the beam total power density is is the same. Okay, so we have two laser beams. Let's imagine they're the same area. They have the same power going through. So if we take the same area, then the density goes away. So we can just look at the power. Now think about the energy of each photon in that beam. Okay, the blue beam, blue photon has more energy than the red photon because it has a shorter wavelength, higher frequency. Okay, we just learned this. Now, if, it, if they need to have the same total power, I need more red beams to compensate for its lower power per photon, right? So in other words, my HC over lambda is smaller for a red beam. That means my phi has to be larger to compensate us that this product is a constant for the blue and the red, right? This term is smaller for red beam. This has to be larger for the red beam. So in other words, I need to have more particle flux from my red beam to maintain the same power density. Now, let me ask you a second question. In this situation, if I shine each of these laser pointers on a solar cell, which will produce more current? Anyone? Uh, did you hear me? Okay. Aprutam, did you hear me? Did yeah, you so, my question? Yeah, so the question is, which of these beams would produce a uh, higher current? if they're incident on a solar cell. So think in terms of how the current is produced, what contributes to the current, and how that fits into the previous problem. Anyone? So. Yes, if there is higher flux, you would expect to have higher current, okay, under some assumptions, right? So if the red beam has higher particle flux, in other words, more photons are hitting it per unit time, per unit area, in theory, it should produce more current. Now, when I say in theory, what does it mean? We are making the assumption that the red photon has enough energy per photon to produce that electron hole pair for the current generation, okay? We haven't re we, we haven't uh, learned that yet, but that's the assumption, and I make that statement. But we will come back to this. Um, you don't have to get too confused. So this was okay. the problem, right?
so we know that the red beam has higher uh, photon flux. So now maybe think in terms of this. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, we should move on. But the key is that you should always be careful. First of all, you should know what the terminology means. Okay, what does photon flux mean? What does power density mean? Those things are important. And like I said, you can always refer to units to, to make sense of them. And second, you should understand how these quantity correlate with the properties that we're interested in, whether it's the current from a solar cell or the temperature of a, of a, of a black body that you're trying to raise its temperature, for instance, okay? And we'll try to make those connections in, this, uh, in subsequent lectures, but I want you to be aware of the basic concepts. Okay, moving on. The, in the previous slide, we made a very simplistic assumption that the wavelength of all the photons in a beam is, are the same, okay? So when I asked you this question, as a red beam has the same power density as a blue beam, the implicit assumption here is that the, all the photons in the red beam have the same wavelength, okay? Or, and all the photons in the blue beam have the same wavelength, which is true when you, if you have a laser beam. But in almost, I would say, 99% of natural sources, this is no longer true, okay? If you take the spectrum of a lamp, it will look very broad. So this is the plot of the spectrum of a, of a lamp in wavelength and in terms of irradiance, which is power per unit area per nanometer. Watts per meter squared per nanometer, okay? Watts per meter squared, something we have seen before, per nanometer simply says how much power is there at a given wavelength. So let's say I pick a wavelength of 300 nanometers. I have about three, I mean, 2.9 watts per meter squared at that 300 nanometer wavelength. That's what it's saying. Okay. So this is of course important because the wavelength determines how much energy is in a given photon. Okay, so if I pick a wavelength at 400, the photons here have more energy than if I pick a wavelength at 600. So the 400 nanometer photons are not the same as 600 nanometer photons. They're not created, all created equal. Okay, this is the very, very important. This represents the energy or power density, not the flux. Now, we can of course calculate the flux as shown here. We'll come to that in a second. And it, that plot will look very, very different. Okay. So the property we are referring to here is something called spectral irradiance or irradiance by itself. So this just is sometimes it's just called irradiance. This is the power density as a function of wavelength. So previously we saw power density by itself, which was watts per meter squared, but now it's per unit wavelength. Watts per meter squared per nanometer. Okay, this is the most common way to characterize a light source. So we'll have the spectrum for a lamp, and this is just showing, okay, when I started off with the brand new lamp, it had a spectrum shown by this dashed line, but after it ran for 1200 hours, its spectrum changed a little bit. Okay, so it's just a simple example. Of course, the, the radiance F can be calculated from the power density H by simply taking H and dividing it by lambda. But in a real uh, source like this, this is not a simple division. You have to take a derivative, right? You have to take the derivative of H with respect to lambda. But under uh, some assumption where we assume that the derivative is simply just dividing it, then you get this simple expression. S is C, which is particle flux, HC over lambda squared. By the way, I should make a quick comment here that you don't need to memorize any equation in this class because the midterm is completely open book and open internet and so on. You just cannot communicate with others. So you don't need to memorize any of this stuff. You should be able to come back and refer to it. Again, the important thing is to be able to understand what, what it is that you're looking at. Okay, 
the next quantity we need to be aware of is something called the radian power density, okay, which is related to the, the, the irradiance. The radian power density is defined as the total power density emitted from a light source, which can be calculated by integrating the spectral irradiance over all the wavelengths of interest. So F of lambda, we saw in the previous slide, is the irradiance or spectral irradiance. And here we are simply taking the integral of f of lambda over all the wavelengths of interest, zero to infinity, d lambda. So all it's saying is simply add up all the power coming out of a light source over all the wavelengths. So this, for instance, is how we calculate spectral, uh, sorry, uh, insulation that we talked about. Now let's take a quick, um, practice of what are the units of H. I want you to again discuss with your neighbor for let's give it about 30 seconds. What are the units of radiant power density? Uh, I'll let you discuss first and then we'll go over it. As you can tell in this class, uh, I like units very much but it, because it allows us to understand what it is we are talking about. That's why I'm trying to emphasize units. But please go ahead and discuss. And feel, feel free to shout out an answer if you, if you have it. Someone must have it. Oh. Okay, you can. Even, you should be able. To, you should be able to guess it. Come on, someone that has the answer, right? Okay, watts per meter square is one answer. Okay, yeah. So, so let, let, so let's stop here and try to understand how will we answer this question, right? So, of course, we can look at the equation. So, we have f of lambda times the d lambda. So. First, let's try to understand what is f of lambda. So I told you in the previous slide, f is, which is irradiance, has units of watts per meter square per nanometer, right? So this is watts per meter square per nanometer. This is nanometer, lambda, so nanometer, in the numerator, cancels the nanometer in the denominator, you end up with watts per meter squared. So the answer is correct. Units of H is just watts per meter squared. And of course, it's kind of obvious because the name is radian power density. Power density is watts per meter squared. Now this, by the way, is how we calculated the 1366 watts per meter squared that we talked about as a solar insulation last week. Simply integrating the spectral irradiance of the sun over all the wavelengths of interest, which we will do in the next few slides. Okay, <clears throat> now we need to understand what a black body radiation is. A, first of all, before we go into the detail, a black body radiation is a simplification of reality. So we should look for that. But it is a very good simplification, a good approximation of reality. So all light sources, such as the sun, incandescent lamps, and even the human body can be modeled. By the way, the human body is a source of light, but it's a source of thermal light, okay, long wave, can be modeled as black body emitters. An ideal black body absorbs all radiation incident on its surface and emits based upon its temperature. That's just the definition of what a black body is. The, the, the reason black body is because of something called the Planck's radiation law. Now, Max Planck in the early 20th century showed you, that you can, photons, uh, I mean, light is quantized. And this was the beginning of quantum mechanics and quantum theory of light. And he essentially showed that if you have a body, um, anything, any any matter at a given temperature, it will emit 
light. But the emission of light has follows a specific spectral signature. And that spectral signature can actually be predicted by this equation. And this is the big uh, victory for the quantum theory of light. Very, very important victory. In fact, this was probably the, the foundation for the Nobel Prize that Einstein won in 1905 for, uh, or 1910 or so for, uh, for the photovoltaic effect for explaining the photovoltaic effect anyway. So let's look at this equation, which is called the Planck radiation law, which is simply predicting the spectral irradiance. So F of lambda, now that we're somewhat familiar with this, this is the spectral irradiance, which is again, the power density per wavelength. Watts per meter square per nanometer can be predicted by this complicated looking equation, okay? So this stuff, and the numerator here is all a constant. So we can ignore this. 2 pi h is Planck's constant, c is speed of light. All of this is just a number. So let's ignore that. The denominator is important. It's just the wavelength of light. So it's lambda over five. So it's very sensitive to wavelength. And this whole term is also important. Of course, that's one, that's not too bad. The bottom has a very interesting term, which is exponent h c over lambda k t minus one. Now here, of course, H, C are constants as we know. K is the Boltzmann constant, again a constant, let's ignore that. So H, C and K, let's throw it out. The only things that are important are lambda and T, T is the temperature. So now you can see the spectral irradiance is a function of lambda here. Lambda is also here, they're both very sensitive. Okay, this is lambda to five, this is in the exponent, so they're both very sensitive but also temperature. Again, you don't need to memorize any of this. I want you to understand what is happening here. But first of all, you can see that as lambda increases, this term decreases very fast. But as lambda increases, this term also decreases. And this exponent decreases. Very fast, right? It's an exponent, but it's in the denominator, which means this whole term increases. So this first term decreases with lambda, second term increases with lambda, which means that there is a sweet spot where everything gets maximized or minimized. So it's not a very simple equation. Indeed, if you plot irradiance as a function of wavelength, you will see a break. As wavelength increases, so here, the second term is dominating, right? As wavelength increases, this term is increasing, 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 increasing. And then suddenly they match up and you get the peak. And then after that, the first term dominates. As wavelength increases, this decreases, okay? And it has a characteristic curve, which is hard to predict, but you can calculate numerically. But again, we don't need to uh, know the details. We just want to quantitatively understand that this now it depends on wavelength and temperature. It has a complicated relationship. Now let's try to tease out some simplicity from this. First, let's look at the curves first. So this outside curve has a temperature of 6,000 Kelvin, which is approximately the surface of temperature of the sun. Okay, so you see a curve which looks like that. Now let's look at something which, which is a little bit cooler, a carbon arc lamp, which has about 4,000 Kelvin still quite hot, which is this curve right here. Let's compare them, okay? It's 4,000 Kelvin, that's itself. First, you will know that it is drastically reduced, right? That the intensity or irradiance has essentially gone down drastically as, as it cooled, which makes sense because it is a highly nonlinear function of temperature, right? 6,000 to 4,000 is not a big difference. There is a drastic change in air radiance, which again reminds us is a very nonlinear function. Second, you notice this peak of this curve here is in this wavelength, okay? It looks yellow, right? But the peak of this curve is now in the infrared. Its wavelength peak has increased. So two observations. One, the total intensity or irradiance has reduced and the peak wavelength has increased. Now let's try to make sense of that in the next slide. Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. From this equation, we can also calculate what's called the total power density. Okay, 
total power density, as we saw in the previous slide, is simply the integral of f of lambda d lambda over all the wavelength. And this complicated equation can actually be integrated. For those of you uh, who, who have fun with calculus can try to do this. And you end up with a fairly simple expression, h equals sigma t raised to 4. OK, lambda has gone right, because you've integrated it out. So the only variable is now t. Sigma is a constant. Sigma is a constant called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. And the units are interesting, joules per second per meter squared per Kelvin raised to four. But the key thing here is that the total power density, which is again, is the how much total power is coming out of a source per unit area. Okay. It's now a very sensitive temperature. It's a function of T raised to four. And let's check the units, joules per second per meter squared. Now T is Kelvins, so Kelvin raised to four. Divided by Kelvin raised to four cancels out. So you end up with H units of H are joules per second per meter squared, which makes sense. Joules per second is watts. This is watts per meter squared. We know power density is watts per meter squared. So everything is good. So you should be able to check it this way. Okay. Okay. Now let's move on. To There's some key properties. So Another important parameter of a black body radiation is the wavelength where the spectral irradiance is maximum. Now, we are all engineers, so we've all taken some basic calculus. We know how to find the maxima of this function. We simply take the derivative with respect to lambda and set it to zero. Okay, it's not hard to do. You, sh you can do it yourself. Okay, now if you do it, you'll end up with, and, and of course for the peak, for the maxima, you have to also show that the second derivative with respect to lambda is negative, right? So we all know this from high school calculus and whatnot. In any case, we won't do it here, but we'll end up with an equation, fairly simple equation, which comes up here. So we see lambda peak in micrometers now, 2900 divided by T temperature in Kelvin. This is referred to as Newton's law. Okay, something you can derive yourself. Okay, now it shows something very interesting. The peak wavelength is now inversely proportional to temperature, which is good, right? Which kind of makes sense. The 2900 is just a constant. Now let's go back here and make sure that makes sense. Peak wavelength, which is this peak here, decreases with temperature. Uh, sorry, increases as temperature decreases. So, inversely so in other words, when this went from 6,000 to 4,000, the peak wavelength increased, right? Went from here to here. And it increases more to 3,000, which makes sense. So qualitatively, we know it makes sense. And this is a very, very useful uh, um, uh, concept here. So, so the temperature of the black body affects both the spectral distribution as well as the total power density emitted. So keep in mind, harder objects will emit more power and peak wavelength emission will also change. I want you to focus on this picture here and answer this question. And you can discuss with your friends. Uh, this is the Orion constellation, and you can see lots and lots of stars. We want to compare the star Betelgeuse with Rigel or Regal. Which one is hotter? And maybe before you shout the answer, you should discuss for, let's give it about 30 seconds as well. And the, answer, and the the equation to use is on this slide as well, obviously. Come on, you can talk <laughs> if you want. Oh, at least say the answer to your neighbor. Okay, any um, any answers? Yep. Right. Yeah, you can shout out. You don't need to put up your hands. Yeah, you're saying Rigel, the blue one? Yes, and why? Because it has a smaller wavelength. Because it has smaller wavelength. Yes, correct. So we know the, the blue white color has shorter wavelength or smaller wavelength than the red. And this has, of course, we also know that this has more, full, more energy, right? So the wavelength. 
But from Wien's law, we know is if this peak is shorter, this temperature is higher. So Regal is hotter than Betelgeuse. Okay, fairly simple. But I can ask you a different question, right? If I take a picture of a of a parking lot at night, which has two different colors of lamps, the color of the lamp determines the temperature of the lamp. Right? If we have something which is more yellow versus which is more red and so on. So you might have heard of these terms, cool blue and warm white and things like that. This is what it refers to. Okay, perfect. Now let's talk a little bit about the material science and the physics of the sun. And the sun itself is a hot sphere made of hot gases, typically uh, plasma, because it's very hot. So the internal temperature can reach over 20 million Kelvin due to nuclear reactions in its core. The, the basic, uh, this, it's a fairly complex and not completely understood um, uh, set of reactions that's going on in the sun, but we can oversimplify this as basically a conversion from hydrogen to helium. Okay, so in, in the deep inner core of the sun, so for, first of all, the sun kind of can be divided as, as a form of layers, kind of like an onion. So you have all these different layers going from uh, the inner core, uh, there's a radiated zone, so the inner core, there's a nuclear reaction happens because of the high temperature and pressure, which converts hydrogen to helium. It's a nuclear fusion reaction at 20 million Kelvin or so. And because it's a fusion reaction, it generates a lot of energy, and that energy gets radiated outside, either through this radiated zone, and there's a convection zone, which essentially means your plasma is super hot gases, which are essentially doing a convection, taking heat from inside and bringing it to the outside. It's something called subsurface flows, basically, again, plasma flows, and then there's a photosphere, which is considered the surface of the sun. There's a chromosphere, which is basically so, sort of like an atmosphere of the sun, but of course, it's not a real atmosphere because it's just plasma. And then there's the corona, which we see. It's outside the, I would say, the dense part of the sun. Uh, I should mention this is not still not completely understood. For instance, we still don't know what happens on the pol poles of the sun. This has never been seen before, the two poles of the sun. Okay, so radiation from the inner core is absorbed by hydrogen ions closer to the surface. The sun's surface or the photosphere temperature is about 6,000 Kelvin, as we saw before. The solar spectral radiance resembles a black body at about 6,000 Kelvin, and that's kind of what it looks like roughly. Sorry. The total power emitted by the sun is the power density multiplied by the surface area of the sun. So it's roughly 9.5 times 10 to the 25 watts. That's a lot of power. That's how much power is coming out constantly from the sun. It's big, so the surface area is big, and the, and the incident power and the emitted power density is also quite high. Uh, we'll see the solar spectrum again, 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 and again, but let's look at it quickly right now. This is spectral irradiance, watts per meter squared per nanometer. We are familiar with this now. And the horizontal axis is wavelength. This wavelength goes from UV, visible, and infrared. And the sunlight peaks around the green, okay, 500 nanometers or so. Um, and and that's, this is the black body radiation. This is sunlight outside our atmosphere, and this is the sun from inside the atmosphere. We'll talk about the, the differences. But let's think about radiation in space first. Uh, of course, we have all these different planets around the sun. So radiance on an object, so as the farther you go, it loses power because it's spread over a larger area. So solar irradiance on an object some distance d from the sun is found by dividing the total power emitted from the sun by the surface area over which the light falls. So it's a simplification, but you can think about the sun as a point source with light emitting in a big sphere outward. So the further you are, the area of the sphere increases, so the power density goes down. So the total power is the same, but it's spread over a larger area. And we can calculate this easily. So again, from Stefan Boltzmann law, we know H naught, which is the, the, the power density from the sun. It's sigma T raised to four, temperature of the sun. Then multiplied by the ratio of the surface areas. So four pi R squared, which is the radius of the sun, divided by four pi D squared, which is the distance away from which we are measuring. So we simplify all the four pi, so we end up with sigma T raised to four, R over D squared. That R is the radius of the sun, the distance at which we're measuring. It. 
So for instance, if you put a solar cell on Venus, its distance is 108 billion meters, the radiance is 2600 watt per meter squared. On Earth, it's 150 billion meters, 1366 watt per meter squared, as we saw last week. If you're in Pluto, which is you know, 5.9 billion meters, it's a little bit less than watt per meter squared. So we should be aware of these. Now, of course, this is, these numbers are important because when we send probes to these planets, we need to have solar cells so to, to power them. Right? Some of them do have nuclear uh, reactors on them, but those are much more complicated. But the vast majority of them actually do utilize the sun's uh, sunlight. The actual power density, of course, it changes a little bit because uh, the the here we are assuming that this distance d refers to a perfectly circular orbit, but no planet actually moves in a circle. In, in fact, almost all of them move in a fairly complex but close to elliptical orbit. So the Earth, for instance, moves in an elliptical orbit, and the sun's emitted power is not constant, so it changes with time as well. Earth is closest to the sun in January and farthest away in July, so you can actually adjust for all that. So the flux, uh, sorry, power density h can be a, is can, uh, at any given uh, time of the year is the h constant, which is 1353 watts per meter squared times some adjustment factor here, one plus 0 0.033 cosine something. But the key thing here is the n here, which is the n is the number of the nth day of the year. The first day, second day, third day, and so on and so forth. So you can adjust those values. And that's what's shown here. So, okay. Yeah, we're all somewhat familiar with this. Now, the spectra change quite a bit. So we have to use some standard solar spectra when we characterize solar cells. So we want to compare a solar cell from one company versus another company. You can't just put it outside and measure it because the, spec the solar spectrum changes every day from day to day and from place to place. So we, people define these standards. And these standards, are for, there are several of them. Uh, so this is an example of AM0 is a standard. It's also referred to as ASTM E490, typically uh, set by the ISO, the International Standards Organization. So this red curve is AM0. Again, this is spectral irradiance, watts per meter squared per nanometer, and this is wavelengths. And this red curve is AM0, which is the spectrum of sunlight out in space, right outside the Earth's atmosphere. AM1.5 global, which is this blue curve here, represents the spectrum on the Earth's surface. So there's some dips here because of absorption within the atmosphere. AM1.5 direct refers to that spectrum, which is shown by this green curve, refers to the spectrum of the sun on the Earth's surface, but only considering direct sunlight, which refers to the difference between cloudy day versus non-cloudy day. This is the non-cloudy day. This is including in the presence of clouds. Uh, this is normalized, of course, so you cannot say that cloudy days have more energy. Uh, that's not what this is trying to say. Okay, so these are just standards, but just keep, uh, one thing you will notice is that on Earth, which is what we will mostly design our systems for, we see these huge dips in the spectrum. Right. You can see these windows here. So we should try to understand where they come from. So solar radiation on the Earth's surface. Uh, while the solar radiation incident on Earth's atmosphere is fairly constant, radiation on the Earth's surface varies widely due to atmospheric effects, including absorption and scattering. Local variations in the atmosphere, such as water vapor, clouds, and pollution. The latitude of the location, so where you are on the planet. The season of the year and time of day, of course. Uh, the parameters that change are spectral irradiance, which is the, 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 the function we just saw, power density, which is the integral of that function, angle of incidence, of course. Right? The key atmospheric effects so for, can be uh, illustrated in this picture. So we have 100% input coming in. This is what happens in absorption. So 2% absorbed by ozone, 1% by upper dust layer, and so on and so forth. About 18% is absorbed in the atmosphere. Uh, some of it's scattered to light space, about 3%. Okay, some of it's dust particles, air molecules, etc. And some of it's scattered to Earth, which is basically like the diffuse part of the light, about 
And what is direct to earth, which is unscattered straight from sun to earth, is only about 70%. So you should keep that also in mind. So reduction in power due to scattering, absorption, and reflection is very important. The change in spectral content due to greater absorption and scattering at certain wavelengths, which is what gives rise to these uh, windows that we saw here. So the spectrum changes from this red curve to the blue and green curve. And introduction of diffuse or indirect component to solar radiation. And this is, of course, very important because we might want to design systems that work not only on cloudless days, but also on cloudy days. So this refers to the diffuse part. And of course, local variations in atmosphere, things like pollution, for example, which can affect global power and spectral content as well. The other atmospheric effect we should be aware of are high absorption of wavelengths and so the photon energies are close to the bond energies of certain gases. So they, they resonate, essentially ozone absorbs certain, certain wavelengths of light, carbon dioxide, water vapor. The far infrared, which is uh, wavelengths greater than two microns or so, is absorbed by water and carbon dioxide. Most of the UV, which is less than 300 nanometers, is absorbed by ozone, but not enough to prevent sunburn. So we should all be careful. These cause deep troughs in the spectrum, which are those windows we saw. Dust and air molecules absorb across the spectrum and reduce overall power. When sun is overhead, all wavelengths are uniformly absorbed and sun looks white. During morning and evening, the optical paths are longer and shorter wavelengths are more effectively absorbed and scattered. This gives rise to a reddish color and lower power density. So when sun is straight overhead, okay, casts very small shadow, the amount of atmosphere that light goes through is shortest. But when it's early morning or late evening, the light has to pass through a lot more of the atmosphere. So it, 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 and you can see this in the longer shadows. Right? So when it passes through more of the atmosphere, it has to scatter more light, and which is why you see all the colors. And you will see the, 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 the red wavelengths get scattered and you see, see, the, see the color. The direct versus diffuse is, is an important concept to keep in mind. The Rayleigh scattering means that basically particles in the atmosphere scatter light. Shorter wavelengths are scattered much more than the longer ones. This is the main reason by the way the sky looks blue, because the blue wavelengths are scattered more than the red wavelengths. So the blue light is essentially scattered in all directions and reaches the rise. Roughly seven to 10% is diffused on a clear day. Um, the power density in AM 1.5, which is the blue curve, is about 28% less than outside in space. And that refers to um, scattering of light and absorption of light within the atmosphere. AM0 is used to characterize solar cells in space. Okay. The atmospheric absorption and scattering can be quantified somewhat by something called an air mass. Air mass is the path length which light takes through the atmosphere, normalized to the shortest path possible. So it's the path taken by light compared to the shortest path, which is here. Okay. So the sun is here, the air mass is one. The sun is here, the air mass is larger than one because you are going through more of the atmosphere. And you can quantify this air mass as one over cosine of theta. Okay, as you get down into the horizon, theta becomes almost 90 degrees, and this cosine theta goes to zero, and air mass goes to infinity. Okay, but if we take the curvature of the Earth into account, a more accurate formula can be calculated, which is shown here. So there's a small correction factor. For us, of course, we will, be, we will completely ignore this for the purpose of this. Uh, direct component on a plane perpendicular to the sun's rays, the intensity of light can be calculated as a function of the air mass as shown here. So you can see as air mass increases, so this is 1.353 times 0.7 AM raised to 0.678. As air mass increases, um, uh, this intensity also increases. But remember, the air mass is. Uh, uh, actually, it decreases because it's a fraction of power, 0.7 raised to air mass. 
Okay, intensity also increases with height above sea level. So Utah and the desert southwest with higher solar power densities. So something which can also be modeled as shown here, where H is the height above sea level. Again, for the purposes of this class, we're going to ignore all these uh, exact equations, but something we should be aware of. Just to reiterate this point, even on clear cloudless days, the diffuse component can be 10% of the direct portion. Okay, so that's actually my last slide. So that ends the lecture today. And I want to spend the remaining uh, time, maybe next five minutes or so, going over the instructions for assignment one. But before I do that, let me ask if there are any questions. Okay, uh, let me just make a quick point. Make sure you review the slides uh, because there are some concepts there which you might not have seen before. So it's useful to kind of review yourself. And certainly these things could be on the exam. So make sure you're aware of them. Okay, so for assignment one, first of all, I the, the teams are almost formed. So again, I'll make one last uh, request. If you have any requests for team members or project topics, this is your last chance to send it to me. I'm going to probably form the teams tomorrow uh, and I will present them on Thursday. Okay? Teams and topics will be assigned uh, at, uh, on Thursday and I'll be there in class. Um, so to reminder, assignment one is a approximately 10 minute presentation in class on September 12th. So make sure you're in class, don't miss the class. Um, the, for, for the online students, you will submit a screen recording with audio of your slides or presentation. Okay, so what do you, what is this presentation? The, the objective of this presentation is for you as a team to become intimately familiar with the project topic. And that can mean many things, but that's basically the objective. Okay, so first I would recommend please select a name for your team. Okay, so I can refer to you by, by some name. Number two, specifically you need to research at least these three things. You might have more topics there, but at least these three. Number one, I'm going to assign a topic to you, let's say solar desalination. So you need to research what are the main products slash solutions that exist today. And you can look at commercial solutions, but you, you know, if you don't find enough commercial solutions, please also look at the research literature, see what other people are trying to do. Number two, what are the main challenges generally in this field? And when I say generally, just in general, okay? So what are the most difficult things that people are trying to solve? And that will lead you also to compare the advantages and disadvantages of the existing products slash solutions. So ideally, I'd like you to make a table with many or multiple distinct advantages and disadvantages of the various products and solutions. Um, I would also say, please add as much detail as possible, include citations, websites, etc. Okay, so you can link to them, refer to them or not. And the key goal here is uh, not to give you more work, but really to lay the foundation that you will utilize for your work in the rest of the semester, okay? So this research will inform your future assignment. So it's imperative that you do as thorough a job as possible. It's not a lot of time, really on a week and a half. I recommend that you split the assignment among your team members as you think fit. So you might say, oh, uh, you know, one of you might be more interested in you know, doing the internet Research. Someone might be interested in the commercial products, whatever. So you, you might want to sit down as a team and kind of decide what you want to do. But you will need to discuss as a group to complete the assignment. I want this to be a group effort at the end of the day. Uh, however, the discussion can be remote. You don't need to necessarily meet in person. You can do it via Slack, Zoom. There's lots and lots of tools out there today. So if you need any help about this, let me know as well. Uh, one last thing is please start early. Don't, don't wait till the last minute. In fact, I would recommend when, when I assign the teams on Thursday, please meet with your team on Thursday and, and come up with a plan or a schedule. <coughs> okay, so we'll, we'll actually stop here. Uh, and I'll ask if there are any questions.